And our next speaker is Dr. Michael Gillis from the Milton Center here. And his topic will be some implications of orality for Midrashian education, where with rabbinic texts is still from an educational perspective, having been led into that last night by the last session. Good luck, Hashem. Okay, an interesting, an interesting uh, issue of the, or instance of the difference in uh, literacy and orality is in the program that I discovered that my name is the only name which is not in a bold font. Of course, the literary text wouldn't matter unless we sort of shouted my name or something. But here it looks you know, as if I'm the, the, uh, the uh, we're part of the subject of uh, Joshua's talk. Um, we apologize. I'm still investigating if it was deliberate or an accident. I've taken it up with the director of the centre. Uh, I want to lead up to a characterization of two pedagogies, one midrashic and linked to orality, and the other pedagogy, pedagogy of pshat, linked to literacy. In this I intend only heuristic categories rather than claiming the existence of a real absolute distinction or great divide. I begin from the premise that midrashic interpretation is of more than merely historical interest. Midrash retains its capacity to grip and surprise, to illuminate the biblical text and to vivify its re relevance. While the hermeneutical assumptions of Midrash differ from modern conventions of proper reading, Midrash is not opaque to us. In some ultra-orthodox settings, the Midrash is treated as the authoritative interpretation. At the opposite end of the spectrum is a critical and sometimes secular approach to Bible education, which aims at stripping away traditional readings to recover original meanings and to discover the process of redaction which brought the text into being. Somewhere in the middle are those who pay respect to Midrash but seek to confine Bible education to a concern with Pshutoshal Mikra, the plain meaning of scripture. There is a long history to the establishment of a hierarchy between Peshat and Drash, going back to the Middle Ages. Later it becomes an established enlightenment prejudice. Yitzchak Heinemann cites Geiger's assertion that the Midrash displays a defective exegetical sense. <laughs> Heinemann himself was perplexed by the modes of Midrashic interpretation, but rather than dismissing it, or uh, dismissing them, he uses the ideas of Lucien Levy Brule and romanticizes these modes as the representations of a poetic, if primitive, mentality. Levy Brule talked of different mentalities but did not have an explanation of how they came about. One set of explanations for cultural change points to, technologi to technologies of communication as the key factor, particularly the transition from orality to literacy. The strong thesis of literacy sees this transition as that which determines a move to a new mentali mentality capable of sustaining abstraction and rational thought. The so-called primitive mind does not then reflect lack of innate cognitive capacity, but the absence of the technologies of literacy, the phonetic alphabet and writing. This line of theorizing has been criticized as overly deterministic and has proposed a great divide between pre-literate primitive societies and advanced literal, literate ones. Goody has recently responded to such criticisms by denying that his claims imply a great divide, or that pre-literate cultures are incapable of logical thought and abstraction, but merely that literacy leads to uh, an overwhelming predominance uh, uh, of, of, uh, of those capacities. Literacy, however, does not automatically bring about changes. A means of communication can be available for a long time without its potential for cognition being exploited. Cultures with written texts may retain attributes of oral cultures in what on calls residual orality. And rabbinic culture seems to be such a case. Um, Kieran Egan, uh, sorry, um, sorry, scholars have also paid attention to the technology of the book itself. Books in the form of scrolls are likely to be seen as repositories of text to be committed to memory and then returned to the library shelf. They serve as no more than supplements to orality. The codex, only belatedly adopted by Jews, offers itself better as an object of continuing study and significantly the possibility of annotation. The move to literacy can be seen to bring losses as well as gains. K. 
Kieran Egan's theory of educational development draws our attention to the costs of the movement from stage to stage, as, for example, we lose imaginative power as we progress from what he calls the romantic stage to the philosophic stage. Egan builds on the work of David Olson to connect these developments in the individual with developments in the history of human cultural development with respect to tele technologies of communication. Egan proposes that we do not entirely lose our appreciation and ability to make use of what we had at the previous stage. This is in distinction from, say, the idea of the, the genetic um, theories of development that we find in Piaget. The cognitive psychologist Jerome Bruner distinguishes between logical scientific thinking and narrative thinking as two ways of knowing which he sees as universal modes of human cognitive functioning, each powerful and functional in its own sphere. And here I quote, they have varied modes of expression in different cultures, which also cultivate them differently. No culture is without both of them, though different cultures privilege them differently. Midrash might be viewed as expressing a predominance of the narrative mode of thinking, while the emergence of Pshat interpretation, and subsequently critical scientific interpretation, reflects the predominance of the logical scientific mode. The orality of Jewish texts has been the subject of many scholarly treatments in recent years. In the case of rabbinic culture, an ideology of morality continued alongside the capacity for literacy among the rabbis. Now here I now offer a number of characteristics of Midrash as oral interpretation. One, the orality of rabbinic text is in a context where the written biblical text is present, even if in a scroll form and generally read in ritual setting, settings. The rabbis seem to have had the biblical text by heart. Holding the text in memory made them able to draw parallels, to hear verbal echoes, to overlook the boundaries between words, verses, paragraphs and books that the written text make constantly palpable. Two, the interpretation is a performance of interpretation. An interpretation may be made in a specific context. It is then remembered, repeated, and adapted in other contexts. As a performance, it is not offered and even less regarded as final, authoritative, or exclusive. Three, works of Midrash tend to be anthological, collecting and collating interpretations. Only, only relatively rarely do we find in Midrash Agadah explicit rejections of opinions. The various readings coexist on the page as interpretive possibilities. And many of the texts retain the agonistic quality of an oral context by recording named opinions. Four, there is an underlying assumption of the polysemy of the text. Its having the potential to generate many meanings is seen as the consequence of the text's divine origin. And finally, five, the Midrashim are not framed as authored works. They are framed as emerging from a collective effort at interpretation. Now much changes in the biblical interpretation of the Middle Ages, and I'm sure we'll hear about this later. This process, I believe, has something to do with the full realization of the potential of writing for commentary and interpretation. David Stern has related the change not only to writing as such, but to the adoption of the Codex. The possibility of running commentary comes into being, and with it also comes the authored commentary. This is commentary which seeks to establish true meaning and not merely to add to the anthology of possible meanings. Polysemy is no longer seen as an expression of the divine greatness of the text, but as a problem for the commentator who must choose the true meaning among possible meanings. In Bruner's terms, a logical scientific mode of thought comes to be privileged over the narrative mode. As Bruner points out, polysemy is an inherent feature of the narrative mode. I quote again. Nor does the interpretation of any particular narrative rule out other interpretations. For narratives and their interpretations traffic in meaning, and meanings are intransigently multiple. The rule is polysemy. Narrative meanings, moreover, depend in only a trivial way on truth in the strict sense of verifiability. The requirement, rather, is verisimilitude, or truth-likeness, and that is a compound of coherence and pragmatic utility, neither of which can be rigidly specified. Rather than exemplifying these differences with samples of Midrash literature, I want to explore these two modes through, the, through two modern examples of Jewish pedagogy, which in turn show the differences, potentials, 
costs and rewards of what might be called a pedagogy of literacy and a pedagogy of morality. And the two figures I will use to think through this distinction are Nechama Leibovitz and Emmanuel Levinas. Now, we'll start with Nechama. And part of this is what I know of al as a, I mean, uh, he has student. A discussion was largely absent from Nechama Leibovitz's teaching. Central to her teaching method was setting questions to the class which she preferred her students to answer individually by noting their answers in their notebooks. This way, every student has to work equally and no one can rely on the correct answer given orally by another more clever member of the class. She would review students' answers as they finish writing and she would pronounce them correct or incorrect, <coughs> or, incorrect. or the most feared cannot possibly be <laughs> the, discipline, the discipline being taught was close reading, whether of the commentaries or the text itself. A student who tried to appeal her decision by suggesting alternative possibilities and thereby opening a discussion was quickly contained. For Nakama Leibovitz, the classical commentators and Mikrash were an unlimited source of insights and understandings. At the same time, her ped in her pedagogy, she sought to highlight rather than blur the exclusive claims of commentators. For example, Rashi and Ramban. Ramban will say, <laughs> Students were encouraged to respect the classical commentators, but not to be in awe of them. As a written documentation of this pedagogy, we can look briefly at one of Leibovitz's Gilyonot. So that's on Parashat Vayigash. I've made a little handout. How much time do I have, Johnny? You've got about, about 10 minutes. How much? Ten minutes. Oh, okay. We have time. Now it's nine. Well, <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, as a teacher, I just want to give out the sheet to you and give them out early. Uh, so here, here I want to not to, not to look at uh, the specific content. This is a gilayon on on parashat vayigash, so it's very close. It's in our minds, and. Uh, uh, it relates to the uh, the speech of um, of Yehuda. When, when Yehuda uh, uh, speaks out to Vayigash, I love Yehuda, and he makes his famous appeal to Yosef. And here you'll know I've, I've made a little uh, scrap, uh, little sort of asterisks in the side to pick out some of the things that I'm looking for. For example, near the bottom of the first page, she brings the commentary of Abba Vanel, and she asks if she, the questions there. Mark Kashela of Pasuk Zer, what's difficult for him in this verse? Uh, uh, and then she asks, Mahi Chushat Perusha. So she's asking for us to assess, to evaluate uh, the quality of, of Abarmanel's uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, if you turn to the, to the second page, uh, she refers to, uh, here she brings the commentary of uh, Sephorno, about a third of the way down. Uh, she, brings, she brings two interpretations, or a number of interpretations, or maybe she's specifically relating to the Rashbam and the Sforno here, and she asks, um, and question number two, Eizo mishtei hadeot nirot lecha, umadua. Which of the two interpretations do you prefer, uh, or seems to you correct, uh, and why? Um, and then the next, uh, the next section, uh, give reasons for each of the two opinions and attempt to uh, decide uh, between them. So I think that these are all these examples when looking at the, the medium rather than the actual content show that her the thrust of her of her pedagogy is a is a pedagogy of 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 shat, of, 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 of a pedagogy which. Again, I don't want to make, uh, exaggerate this, but uh, tends towards the idea of making a decision between uh, between alternative interpretations being the most adequate or, 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 or correct. So now, from there, I'd like just to, to move on to uh, to Levinas as a as, uh, as a contrast, and um, I know that Levinas is very popular, except with Talmud. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, with that reservation in mind. Um, uh, I think that we can see that uh, Levinas' pedagogy is, is, is different. I'm using him as a, 
as a, um, as a representative of what, I, what I'm calling the, the pedagogy of orality, which is closer to what I'm arguing to the spirit of Midrash. So in his, his Talmudic readings are what I would call interpretive performances. The readings were given as oral presentations, and Levinas is careful to preserve this orality, this oral ca character, even in their uh, literary renditions of when they're published in, in books. And he uses such devices as retaining his tangential introductory remarks. You hear him kind of clearing his throat at the beginning of the, of the talk. He refers to people present in the audience, and he mentions the things that were said uh, at earlier sessions of the colloquium. So he leaves those in as to constantly remind us that we're talking about uh, an oral performance of interpretation. And Levinas himself observes the match between the mode of the Talmud itself and the oral mode of his own readings. And here I quote, we have retained the rhythm of their original oral version in their current written form, the oral, ver oral version um, of the Talmud readings themselves. This form seems suited to the presentation of passages from the Talmud, which is an oral teaching. Even in its transformation into tractates, the Talmud preserves the openness and the challenge of living speech. To interpret the Talmud, Levinas states, the pages of the Talmud, mischievous, laconic in their ironic or dry formulations, but in love with the possible, register an oral and tradition, an, an oral tradition and a teaching which came to be written down accidentally. <laughs> it is important to bring them back to their life of dialogue or polemic, in which multiple, though not arbitrary, meanings arise and buzz in each day. So the art of teaching the Talmud is to revive its life uh, in, in orality. Being in love with the possible characterizes the Midrashic concern to accumulate possible meanings rather than establishing the meaning of the text. Similarly, Levinas's reference to the multiple meanings. The life of these meanings is not in each one in itself, but in their resonance with each other, in their mutual buzz, which is the word that Levinas used. Levinas adds a further layer in which he himself suggests his own plurality of interpretations of the Talmudic texts. So that Levinas uh, suggests one possibility and then moves to another possibility, but it is not moving from one to the other to cancel out the, uh, the earlier possibilities, but they kind of coexist and resonate with one another. And um, if you turn to the handout, uh, again, I, uh, I hope this will work, uh, to highlight a few points, again, not looking so much at the content of the reading, this is the very first reading in the collection, uh, Nine Talmudic Readings, uh, in Annette Aronowitz's translation, um, but you can, for example, on page uh, 18, I put little, again these little asterisks in the side. Um, um, uh, he writes, you know, he's given presented one opinion on the on the Talmud. This passage deals with the issues of asking for forgiveness uh, for offences committed against one's fellow. It is in any case, Rabbi Yosef uh, Bar Felbot should be uh, puts the following objection to Rabbi Abahu. Who no, thought, who no doubt thought the way our Mishnah did. So again, the, the way in which he introduces the second opinion uh, on top of the first opinion. And then, if you begin the next paragraph, to this the interlocutor replies, what does Elohim mean? Are you sure that Elohim is equivalent to God? So he sees these as not a series of um, proposals and then objections that, that cancel out each other, but they continue. And so, in the next paragraph, that he, 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 in his voice, he allows Rabbi Yosef when Barathel were to come back again for his opinion to reassert itself. Um, as you see on the beginning of the next page, that we, that Rabbi Yosef Barathel were to maintain the same meaning for all terms throughout the verse, because we're dealing with the interpretation of a, of a verse, keeps to his position. Um, um, then the next part, later in the page, but does Rabbi Yosef Barathel, who is so expert in exegesis, uphold the literal meaning of the verses? Doesn't he also have an idea in the back of his head? And all the time, that's what Levinas said. What is the idea in, their, in, the, in the back of their heads as they propose their various uh, opinions and interpretations? And once we delve to that level, Levinas believes that we have things that have a sustained uh, value 
and say that are not, are not opinions that cancel each other out or replace one another. Uh, maybe just one uh, uh, last example from page 21. I just underlined the word. We can now understand the misreadings of the Talmudic interpretation. For, for Levinas, of course, when he's using the word misreading here in an ironic sense, because for him, uh, the misreadings are the, are the better readings. So again, in a way, it's upsetting the, uh, the hierarchy or the privileging of, of uh, chattel over drush by reasserting the value of the misreading of, of drush. So, um, um, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm looking, I've got too many sheets of paper in front of me, so I'm looking for my interest. So to sum up then, I've tried to make a case for the connection between the Midrashic mode of interpretation and orality. This is a mode in which interpretations are performances, in which the need for a fixed, decided meaning is not privileged over the possibility of many and new meanings. I have tried to connect the notion of commentary as the search for true or correct meaning with the internalization of the power of literacy, particularly combined with the adoption of the codex as the physical technology of the book. Both modes represent achievements of Jewish culture, and both should be kept alive in the content of the curriculum and modalities of instruction. In the Hamer Leibitz and Emmanuel Levinas, we have living exemplars of their abiding vitality as the ways of thinking, reading, and teaching. Interesting the different uses of imagination that we're seeing last night and this morning. Last night, imaginative techniques for the retention of content, and today, imagination for entering into the world of the other in an interactive setting. So this will be good if, if we ever if we do write this up and compare between the articles. There's plenty of basis for comparison.